And the gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sudeces, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is the law, in the law is the greatest? He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus told them, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him the Lord, how can be he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day forward did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. May God add his blessing and understanding to the hearing of his word. Anybody want to pray for the preacher this morning? Okay, then, let's just, oh, Alexa's up. Oops. Toby's up. Everybody needs prayer, so I am have to always pray. Amen. Lord, we gather here in this sanctuary that is intended to focus our thoughts and our hearts and our minds on you. We hope that as we're led by Pastor Terry, that you hold her in special focus yourself so that she can deliver to us the things that we need for the coming week and months so that we can understand better what it is that you have for us to do in our lives that represent what it is that this church, Epworth, is really all about. Help Pastor Terry to understand that she's loved and supported and know, know that we are here for her, even in times of doubt. May you put your hand on her to help in healing any way that you can, her body, her mind, her soul, her spirit. In this we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Toby. Now, I thought about naming this sermon, The Mic Drop. Not like Mike Gillespie, not where I'm going to drop him, but you know what a mic drop is, right? Boom. We drop the mic on the floor. It's like the punctuation of a powerful statement. There are a lot of powerful statements in today's lesson. Look at what Jesus quotes when he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The book of Leviticus, the law from the Torah, the holiest part of scripture for the Jewish population. What does he say? I am the Lord. Boom. Mic drop. Because I always say anything that's punctuated with I am the Lord your God is something that's going to get my attention pretty quickly. But as I read the lessons again and again and again, there was a word that kept coming up again and again and again, shall. Shall. What does shall mean? Anybody want to take a shot at what shall means? You're compelled to. That is exactly what it means, but we've gotten away from that usage so much. And there are lawyers in the world who are trying to get shall taken out of legal documents because of the confusion over what it means as opposed to what it doesn't mean. I read an article written by a judge that said shall is an interesting and peculiar word, and it certainly is, because it can be used to express what's inevitable or seems likely to happen in the future. That's what the dictionary says. We shall have to be ready, or we shall see. Have you ever said that to your kids? We shall see. We shall see. It means no, right? It's when you don't want to say no right away to your kids. You say, we'll see. Down the road, we'll see. At least my parents used it that way. Or just to express simple future. When shall we expect you? Or used to express determination. They shall not do something. And really, you get to the fourth and fifth definitions in the dictionary that you tend to see what shall really was supposed to mean in its original form. 
He used to express the command or exhortation, you shall do this. We're used in laws, regulations, or directives to express what is mandatory. It shall be unlawful to carry weapons into the church. Shall is an imperative command. Anybody, other, any other English nerds here today? Former English majors who you know what the imperative is? The imperative is when you say something to somebody like, you've got to do that. My husband used to say to me, if I worked at church all day, I'd come home and speak to him in the imperative, and it didn't work. So I'd say, uh, honey, do you mind going here? I'd say, honey, get over there and do that. He'd say, no, thank you, ma'am. Anybody ever talk that way to your spouse or your kids in that imperative voice? Well, can't be more imperative than Jesus in this lesson, can it be? Because they ask him a trick question again to trick him up. Now, we didn't pick up exactly where he left off last week because this week he's been arguing with the Sadducees. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Now, what would he be arguing with the Sadducees about? Anybody remember what the Sadducees' big bone to pick with Jesus was? They didn't believe in what? The resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see? That's one you learned in seminary years ago. They want to trip him up, so they ask him a question about when you get to heaven, who are you married to? If you're married, you know, if your brother died, you had to marry his wife and have children. If you died, then he had to marry all your brothers. What if a woman was married to like eight or ten brothers and she got to heaven, who would she be married to? That's the question they asked to trip him up. But today they're asking him a different question. Which commandment is the greatest? Okay, here's, here's your, your Bible question du jour. How many commandments were there in the Torah, the five books of Moses? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How many laws were there? Anybody want to guess? Hmm? Somebody over here said something. What did you say? 613. Very good. Toby knew there were over 600 laws. Which one's the greatest Jesus? So what's the odds of getting that one right? One in 613, right? They think they got him this time. They nailed him. Jesus says, there's something they cannot dispute, the Shema, hero Israel. Here, like shall, meaning not just listen, not let the sound come into your head. Here means to obey, to hear, to take it to heart, and to do it. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with what? Your heart, your soul, your mind. And the second is like it, he says, you shall love your neighbors yourself. How can they argue against that? Because we saw in Leviticus, Jesus said, He's quoting God, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Mic drop. Boom. So, well, let me do what I did at the first service. Let me see if you can name all ten commandments. The big ten. What was the first one? You shall have no other what? Other God before me. What's second? You shall not make for yourself any graven image. Sleepy, dopey, and doc, right? Come on, come on, you know these. Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Then they move toward other people. What else are the commandments? Honor your mother and father. What? That's not one of the Ten Commandments. Not kill. Not covet, not commit adultery. Not bear false witness against your neighbor. We had the covet, I think. I think we did we say covet in here. Well, we gotta get out Exodus twenty boys and girls, open it up and read it sometime. You gotta remember these. Jesus had said to them, Honor the Lord your God. Oh, keep his day holy. We forgot the Sabbath there. Any other? Alrighty. Well, Jesus is covering both those halves because half the Ten Commandments, not quite half, cover what? Relationship with God. Shall have another God before me, you shall not make any graven image, you shall not take my name in vain. These are the things God says. So you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Second, it's like you love your neighbors yourself because that sums up the rest of the commandments. And Jesus says, in fact, all the law and prophets hang on this. This law, 
of God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, before we get any farther, let's talk about loving yourself. This is not what we're talking about this morning here, okay? Because that's sort of a 20th, 21st century concept of uh, loving yourself means that you're going to have trouble accepting love from others, things like that. It's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about loving other people, meaning that their life is as important to you as your own. Meaning that you look at other people and you say, I want to be treated the way I treat others. I want to eat every day, so you have to eat every day as well. I want to be treated justly, so I need to treat you justly as well. That's what we're talking about here. And not a psychological sort of emotional thing. But I don't say that's not important, okay? If you don't love yourself, it's going to be hard to love anybody else. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He is saying to a group of people who had many enemies, love your neighbors, you love yourself. Now, in Luke's gospel, a lawyer stands up and says what to him after that? Who's my neighbor? And then we have that great story about the Samaritan on the road. But who are you exempt from loving in this? Nobody. You've got to love each other. You've got to love the world. You've got to love yourself as dearly as you love other people. It's not easy, is it? And Paul, in the letter to the Thessalonian church, the oldest writing that we have in the New Testament is First Thessalonians, talks about what they did among people. They loved them like a nurse loves her babies in her care, even though they had not been treated very well. Even though he had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, where they threw him and Silas into jail, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit, impure motives, or trickery. Just as we've been approved by God and entrusted the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. You've got to please God first and then please other people by loving them the way God has loved you. We don't do that, we're lost. So who's hard to love in the world? Who's hard to love? You all have somebody, right, who plucks your nerves. But then there are people on the greater scope of things. Look at what's happening in Israel right now in Gaza. People have good reason to hate each other, don't they? But these are people who are called to love no matter what the cost. It's hard to know how to do that in the world, isn't it? But you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to love with all my heart, my soul, my strength? So we say in that wedding vow, when you give somebody the ring, you say, with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you. All that I am, all that I have, I honor you. Putting everything in your life at God's disposal for God's use, for God's purpose. It means you've got to give up grudges, kids. You've got to give it up. You've got to give up anger for people who have upset you. You gotta give up hating people who have hurt you or hurt those you love. I was on YouTube yesterday looking at my podcast on the lessons for the lectionary and it went into a frontline special on how Jesus became Christ. And I watched it all afternoon. I sort of napped a little in the middle. But I woke up and saw this story of Perpetua. Anybody know who Perpetua was, one of the early Christian martyrs? Most of the Roman emperors tolerated Christians. And as a sect of Judaism, which we started out, they said that, you know, you didn't persecute Jews who didn't participate in the, the required worship, giving a pinch of incense to the emperor's statue or declaring the emperor God. Jews were exempt from that, but as Christians and Jews sort of went their separate ways, Christians started to be persecuted. There was a woman named Perpetua who insisted on being put to death and smiled as she went to her death and said, I will not worship anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. She was tied to a post where wild animals tore her body apart. I sat there and watched that and thought, wow, that is some faith in Christ there. And then they told stories of other Christians along the way who put God first no matter what it cost them. Corey Ten Boom, who during the Nazi occupation hid Jews in her home and they came and they said, you have Jews hiding here? She couldn't lie. She said, yep. She was arrested and taken to prison. She survived, but she never saw her father again. 
There are people who will put Christ first no matter what the cost. We're not asked to give that much, are we? Anybody here ever been asked to give your life for Christ? Probably not. We're asked to give up other things for Christ. We're asked to give up our animosity toward others. We're asked to give up our ability to hold a grudge. We're asked to give up nasty comments that we make to each other, snarky comebacks, things like that. We're called to give all that up in the name of Jesus Christ, and we can do it with his power and his spirit alive and at work in us so that we can truly learn to love. As God is our witness, we never came to you with words of flattery or a pretext of greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or others. We might have made demands of apostles of Christ. We're gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you've become very dear to us. It's hard to give yourself away, isn't it? It's hard to give yourself away, because the world's going to demand a lot from you. You're all busy people. I know how busy you all are. But you're called to give yourselves away to Christ first, who is the very image of God. I only know when Jesus turns the tables on them, doesn't he? He asks them a question. Let me ask you this. The Messiah, whose son is he? And they all say, why, David. Ah, wrong answer. What do we learn from this? We learn that Jesus was a devout Jew. Jesus was very human. Jesus is the Son of God, and that he was literate. He could read. We know that from Luke's Gospel, where he goes to the temple and asks for the scroll of Isaiah and unrolls it and knows exactly where to go. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because I've been anointed to what? Preach good news to the poor, recovery of sight to blind, release to the captives, set at liberty those who are oppressed, to declare the year of the Lord's favor. He can read, and he knows where to go, because he knows the Scripture. So if you want to know God with all your mind, read the book. Read the scriptures. You want to know God with all your heart. Love God. Every day, love God. Make sure you say these words. This is what devout Jews say three times a day, the Shema. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Three times a day they recite that. Now, one of the commentators I listened to said this was the Catholic alternative they prayed the Lord's Prayer three times a day in the past. Now it's just the Amish who tend to do that. But what if we prayed the Lord's Prayer three times a day? What if we did that every day and said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? We'd have to be doing his will, wouldn't we? Forgive us as we forgive others. Or as I like to put it, forgive us only to the extent that we're willing to forgive someone else because that's what you're asking God to do. But how many of you would join with me this week in trying the Shema three times a day when you wake up, first words out of your mouth to God. We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. At lunchtime, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Before you go to bed at night or at dinner, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You shall love your neighbors, you love yourself, you shall. Now how many of you saw the movie years ago with Yul Brenner and Deborah Kerr? Um, the King and I. Anybody see The King and I? But she sing to him, Shall we dance? Da, 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 da. Shall we dance? Now you know the story, right? Of Anna and the King of Siam. He was a pretty tough customer. What she said to him, You shall dance. Her head would have been gone, wouldn't it? She would have been out of the country, at least. So, shall we, or... Shall we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, or we shall love the Lord our with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind? At birth, can you say with me, we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. We shall love our neighbors, we love ourselves. Let it be so, Lord, let it be so. Amen, amen, amen.